Come in, builders. This week, it is finally time that we address the ghost in the room, the specter that has haunted many of the nations that we have covered, both directly, indirectly, one of the biggest influences alongside Ermor in the early age of Dominions, and that is Therados, the Telkin Spectre. Let's see what they're all about. Therados was once a kingdom of sages and craftsmen ruled by the Telkins, sea diamonds of almost godlike power. When the Telkins made themselves god kings and threatened the divine order, their entire kingdom was drowned and cast under the waves. The people of the old kingdom suffered the full wrath of the divine judgment, and unaware became ghosts inhabiting the ruins of a sunken kingdom. Of the Telkin kingdom, only a few islands remain, inhabited by survivors of the cataclysm. On these islands, the living serve the unaware dead out of fear and respect. On the islands of the Shattered Kingdom also live the Dektoi, dwarven smiths and servants of the Telkin. With the death of the Telkin, the Dektoi replaced them and became revered by the Theodian ghosts. The Dektoi and their Hectoride sisters bring life to the remains of the ancient kingdom and prevent a total destruction of their home. Now, Therados is a drowned kingdom of ghosts and human islanders ruled by the Dactoil master smiths. This was a nation that was very powerful uh, in the age before the early age. And with the gods striking this island down, there were a lot of ramifications. This is what inspired Makone to declare their war on the gods. The gods that exist now are no good for the old races, and they should be gotten rid of. And for Makone, they think that they should be in charge. But this is a group that directly spawns off Baratos. Baratos are survivors of this incident, quite, quite tied in there. The Arcasifali know of them, Ermor know of them. Many, many things get set in motion because of the downfall of Therados. For national features, we are ghosts, Kertes, and humans. Ghosts do not need supplies and can enter the sea. The Kertes can enter the sea. For military, we have ghosts, spectral hoplites, and infantry. We have the Kirti and human sacred war dancers. So those are our normal sacreds and some uh, like wish, wish version of our sacreds that we can get in coastal forts. Magic wise, we are very strong in nature, very strong in water. We're okay to pretty strong in earth. We have a bit of air. We have a small amount of fire and a very rare, I think our best death is a 25%, but death is exceedingly important for us, so this is a, a problem. Our Dactyloi are skilled mage smiths. Boy, we have been playing a lot of smiths lately. <laughs> Our fees are average. We do have a slow to recruit holy two, otherwise, we are restricted to priest ones. And when we bless our sacred war dancers, they go berserk. Uh, that's just part of their I am being blessed, I get this thing. Our dominion is a pop kill dominion. It is influenced both by your death scales, which you will probably take, and by the strength of your dominion. Our dominion summons in spectral troops, although it is a small trickle, unfortunately. Death scales increase the number of ghosts that are summoned. Our dominion kills populations, but our forts prevent the death of the entire population. So it'll leave a little bit left. One of our big weaknesses here is our pop kill is pretty darn strong and we need a lot of money because we need to build forts because we get ghosts in forts, essentially. It is important that we get infrastructure out kind of early and ahead of ourselves so that we get some time to build up some money. Blessing and scales, we get a death limit increase of one and a magic increase limit of one. The death is quite good for us. I think it is worth going death instead of growth. Our buildings are advanced forts. What that means is we actually can build all the way up to castles, which is unfortunate that we're going to wipe out most of our population because we will not be able to get as much out of that. Conversely though, that also means it's really hard to siege us out. A castle filled with ghosts and things that are summoning in reinforcements is quite difficult to crack. So that is a very nice. Good, good to have that because 
if you are playing against people, everyone will dogpile you because you're a pop kill nation. So if you're thinking of playing any pop kill nation, but in this case, Therados, just know that you are public enemy number one. Everyone knows you're public enemy number one. Just realize that. You are essentially declaring war on the entire world if you play a pop kill. For our site, we have Tahinus, which was our capital island, which was sunk beneath the waves. Allows us to recruit our cap-only stuff. In addition, we have a healthy gym income of 3 earth, 1 air, 1 water, 1 death. Our units here look really thin, but that's because we mainly rely on free spawn. In the game behind me here, I recruited a couple Kirtets, which are our cap-only sacred. They're... yeah, they're okay. They... they can... They are sacred. They are amphibious. They're magic beings, which generally is only a negative. There's not really a lot of good that comes out of that. You have to be led by mages. There are some spells and some items that will affect you because you're a magic being. We also have bad formation fighter. We are similar to the burning ones from early age Abyssia, where we start dancing when we get blessed with the sacred dances, and that gives us berserk automatically which can be kind of nice, but it also means that our attack density is going to be very low. We only have a bronze sword. We just have one attack coming out. Not particularly strong, although not bad. We wear bronze ge uh, gear, which is good because we are amphibious, so we're going to go underwater. Generally speaking, I think these guys are a trap because you're probably not going to need that big a bless. You can't get that many. They're going to be a big drain on your economy, which you may not be able to afford. 11 gold per year each. They're only 28, 23, 36, so that's not bad. But you're going to kill off your pop, so at some point your recruitment points tanks. You're going to have money problems. I don't know about this. In addition, in Coastal Forts, we have the Corybant, which is kind of the Wish.com version of our Sacred. And they wear actual iron gear. They are not amphibious. They are human, unfortunately. And yeah, this is the trap because you think, oh, I can get these out of every Coastal Fort. So it'll be good to get a good bless on them. But they're just worse versions of the other one. And I just don't find that they're particularly useful. Otherwise, for human troops, we have a standard human archer with a short bow. They're okay. Uh, they'd be, they're usable if you want to. We have a Peltast, usable light infantry, you know, standard Peltast troop. He is wearing the very, very light stuff, so he's dirt cheap. That is something he has going for him. We have the Therodian Hoplite. Note, this does not have Formation Fighter, and they are wearing good Hoplite heavy gear, but again, 8 gold per year, which is actually pretty good for this unit with 18 protection. They're very high on resources though, and you're probably going to dump scales, so that, they're going to be hard to get out in any number. All that being said about the humans, I didn't recruit a single one this game. Not a single one. You start underwater as Therados, so none of these are relevant to help you expand. By the time you get on land, eh, just eh. I would, I would focus in on your free spawn and doing things with that, doing things with mages, doing things with thugs. That's where I think the money is at for Therados. And with our mod we are running here, we can check our free spawn. We have a whole slew here. Uh, breaking normal fashion, I am going to talk about the commanders here that are free spawn. We have a Spectral Commander. Pretty good. This is like a Hoplite Commander. He's got 100 undead leadership, so he can put them into formations. All of our undead are going to be amphibious. They're going to have cold resist, poison resist, be undead, not need to eat. They're ethereal. Ethereal means we have a 75% chance of mundane weapons just not affecting us. We are floating, so there's a few spells that require uh, you to be on the ground, like Earth Meld, to be hit by it, so we will not have that. We also have the bonus of equivalent of having Swamp or Forest Survival for moving through places. Quite nice. Uh, we're also unaffected by snow when moving on the map, so that is handy. We have a vulnerability to Salt that, to my knowledge, is only a craftable item that people could craft and put on their on their units. I've 
don't see much of it. Yeah, it doesn't do it. Uh, one of the things that brought Therados down in 6, I believe, I don't remember this being the case in 5, we have Spirit Form. And what Spirit Form does is spells that buff you, like Iron Skin, Bark Skin, Skeletal Body, do not affect ghosts, ethereal units. So what that means is, if you want to buff protection, we need to go through invulnerability. We cannot use our, our relatively good earth or in our relatively good nature to give them protection. And this is one of the big weaknesses of our ghost units. They're all gonna have zero protection. Now, luckily, we do have the shield, and if you parry an attack, you do get the protection of your shield. So it's not as abysmal as it looks. We also generally use long weapons on our ghosts. In this case, it's a length four spear, so we can do repelling. We, we don't realize that we're dead. So we are undead that actually have morale, and our morale is okay to not so okay, depending on the unit. So in this case, our commander has 13. We have Spirit Sight because we are ghosts, so we have full night vision, which can definitely help us if we want to get into the caves or uh, cast darkness spells to help ourselves. And our ghost hoplites have Formation Fighter, so quite useful there. So overall, this is a free spawn commander. You'll never feel like you have enough of them, they're pretty good and very usable. Next up, we have the E4. Very important unit for us. This is a Holy One Sacred. He's got the same template of abilities that we just looked at. Note he has very bad morale. He has paralyzed his melee attack, but you'd never want him to do that. What's important here is we are an undead priest, and what that allows us to do is to call specters. These guys can spawn in our free spawn, and you're definitely gonna wanna do that because the native spawn rate is way too low. You need as many ghosts as you can possibly get, and these guys are one of the ways that you can do it. We do get a conjuration spell for nine death gems. You can summon one of these guys in. They also can free spawn in, I believe it needs to be a forted temple to allow these guys to spawn in. Next up, we have the Spectral Philosopher. Very, very strong researcher. We have the normal suite that we've been looking at. He comes in with 10 research ability, and note he has Philosopher plus two. So what that does is, this unit has improved research in Lands of Sloth. So you get a plus two to your research for every level of Sloth. So natively, we could go to minus two, so Sloth two and that would give us 14 research. Pretty darn good. We can summon these guys in with a unique conjuration spell. The previous one and this one are both uh, conj zero, so you start the game with them. It is 11 death gems, however. So while this is very good, they're hard to get out because they're just so expensive. That being said, they don't have any upkeep or anything, so they are an amazing researcher. You're gonna love them. All right, next up, let's look at the Spectral Archer. It's a standard shortbow archer, but you're spectral. So we have our ghost stuff going on, and we also need to talk about spectral weapons, which I didn't cover on the commander. Spectral weapons are unfortunate. When you hit somebody with a spectral weapon, they get a magic resist check for half damage. Note this does not say that we were armor negating or anything, so we are just a normal piercing damage. So they are magic weapons, so big bonus there, but they get a save for half damage. So our troops aren't quite as killy as they might otherwise look to be. That being said, one of the interesting things about the Spectral Archer and our Spectral Pelotast is because they're ghost arrows, they work underwater. Most underwater nations, maybe they have a buckler, maybe, but generally speaking, they don't bother because why would you? Nobody has a ranged weapon underwater. Well, we do. So that is a nice advantage. Some of the kind of um, very killy but light underwater things like shamblers get eaten up by arrows very, very well. So very strong unit underwater. Above water, they're... Okay, archers, nothing really to write home about. 10 precision, they're okay. It is a short bow, so not the strongest thing ever. We're in early age, so short bows are still okay, generally speaking. Nice unit, good to have. Next up, we have the Spectral Pelotast. 
very similar to what you would see on a normal one. Note we have a spectral shield, which is protection 15, a way heavier shield than you normally would get on a Pelotas type unit, but no protection, 13 defense skill, and that includes your shield parry of, of three. So not the most defensive unit. You do have javelins and they do have two ammo. Uh, they are spectral, so people get to save for half. I don't particularly love these units. I find them mediocre. They're magic weapons, so if you hit your own guys, they actually can hit you through your etherealness. They're okay. They're okay. They're free. That, that is their big selling point. You can set them up on your flanks. You can set them up behind your main line. Um, maybe have them take a charge for your hoplites. They are still using a spear, so it's length three, so you can get repels on certain things. So they're not misery or anything, but they're not they're not special. I don't I'm not happy when I see a bunch of these. I am happy when I see a bunch of spectral hoplites. So normal suite of things we've been looking at. They are formation fighters. We have 12 morale, so not the best, but not the worst. We have a spectral long spear, so a length four. So even against normal spear units, you can try to repel. We have the shield at 15 which is quite nice. And with our formation fighter, we're gonna have four of these in a square. So decent attack density with a repelling weapon. Our attack's slightly above average, so that's pretty good. Now it is spectral, so they get to try to save for half damage. These guys are all right. They hold up okay in your front line. Now note, we're ghosts, we're undead, we're ethereal. Banishment, magic is gonna wreck your front line badly. These guys do really good against things that are just mundane. Mundane things generally really struggle to get through them. But then you'll go into some battle with like a holy two priest or something and he'll just wipe these guys out. Magic resist 13 is not that high. You will fail rolls. So just note like they have a distinct magical weakness a distinct weakness there. So just watch what you're running into when you're fighting with them. Finally, we have a spectral Karet. This is a spectral version of our sacred. And again, like you have all these sacred. So you keep thinking, man, these are gonna be so good to get a big bless for. I just don't find them to be that good. Any version of that sacred in this game, not a single time did I have an outcome that I was like, oh, they did really good there. And I had an okay bless. I'll show you what I used this time later on. They just did, let me down over and over and over again. They are sacred, so they get that. Yeah, they're just not as good. I don't believe these ones get the auto berserk either. Or if they did, I didn't even notice. That's how unimpactful they were. They do have that bad formation fighter, so they can't pack in. They do at least have higher magic resist, so... Maybe you can try to draw the banishments onto them since they have a better chance of holding out. Now note, you don't get them choose where you get these. They're just free spawn. So maybe you get a bunch of them. Maybe you don't get many. That's unfortunate. They also are undead. So your normal sacreds do not like to be grouped up with these. That will cause a group morale penalty. So you need to keep them separated. Please don't sue me. So very interesting, good-ish free spawns they're definitely better than like long dead so you have that going for you you have the advantage of being able to do range underwater now unfortunately i will just speak about this here since we're talking about so many ethereal units there's a lot of things underwater in early age that have magic weapons basalt weapons from uh atlantis uh pelagia has magic weapons on some of their troops yeah, there's just a lot of magic underwater, and they will eat these alive. So it can be rough. You need to take underwater over. You cannot let them build up. In the game behind me here, I had Pelagia and I had Atlantis. And my early game was pretty rough. I lucked out and I got on land early, and I kind of like built up above ground while just holding out below water until I would gotten kind of a critical mass and could finally push them out. Once I did get my critical mass, I wiped the floor with them, but it was very sketchy early. I took a couple battles not realizing how many magic weapons I was going up against, and I paid for it dearly. 
Because remember, these are free spawn, and yeah, you can summon some in, but you summon them in on either free spawn or very expensive paid-in units. So you'll never have as many as you'd like, and replacing losses is very difficult. Uh, you can't just go to a fort and queue up 10 ghosts. Just be aware of that. Moving on, let's take a look at our commanders, and we have some great stuff here. Um, I'm going to start with these humans on this side. We do have a scout. He's a standard scout. You cannot get him underwater, obviously. So you're not going to get as many scouts out in the early game as you'd like. It took me quite a while to get my first scout out in this game. Next up, you have a normal human hoplite commander. I didn't recruit any of these. Maybe I'd recruit one to build a fort. Maybe I'd, you could just get an indie that would probably be cheaper. I'm not a huge fan of these guys. They are wearing iron gear, so even if you had a way to get them underwater, it wouldn't be good. Now let's look at the interesting ones. We have the Melia. This can be recruited in our capital and all underwater forts, which we can build, and all coastal forts. So most of where you'd want to build fortresses. And she is a very good chassis. She gets Aw, just right off the bat. Aw 3, so pretty high. She comes in with Nature 1. She's a, a Priest 1, is sacred. And she gets a random of Air, Water, or Earth. The most useful ones are probably the water ones because you can quicken self, uh, liquid, liquid body, and moss body. So this is a good thug chassis, quite good. Despite her low HP, you've got good thuggy paths, you're relatively cheap for what you can do. You are an amphibian, although poor. You have recuperation, which is very nice on thug type units. You have some supply bonuses, that won't be relevant. She has inspirational, which is quite nice and can lead your undead troops, your magic troops, and normal uh, troops, so very good there. She also has Reduce Unrest, which just passively lowers uh, unrest in your, in your provinces, which can be kind of nice. We have another guy who raises it naturally, so these can either counter that or just help you not have to patrol things. Pretty handy there. Her generic gear is just a bronze sword, a bronze cuirass, and a hoplon, so no hat unfortunately. Okay gear that gives her a 10 on average, and that's brought down drastically by her head not having anything. This is a thuggish chassis that will need gear, probably wants some sort of area of effect weapon, a shield, and probably a helmet, but you can do you can go cheaper, you could go more expensive. Uh, a lot of items in Dom 6 now add HP, which drastically helps them out there. With a thistle mace or some gems, you could do some personal regen. Lots and lots of things you can do here. They also are great for building your infrastructure, for moving troops around, for site searching early on. A very, very good mage slash commander. Very useful. Next, we have the Dactyl. Uh, these are those little dwarf guys that are in charge now. Uh, very nice. They're cap only, unfortunately. They are amphibious. They're magic beings. They have Master Smith 1. Magic path wise, we have Air 1, Water 1, Earth 2 and a 100% random of fire, air, water, earth, or death. So we have a 25%, no, excuse me, we only have a 20% chance of getting death. So, and this is our only native death guy. So if you wanna call in your E4 or your spectral philosopher, you have to rely on a 20% chance. And we've seen time and time again how dangerous that can be. So I think one of the considerations for your pretender design is having some death. It doesn't need to be high, but having at least some death so you, you're you guaranteed having some access to those spells. Because it sucks when you play a game, it's like 10 turns in and you haven't got a single death guy. It hurts quite a bit. And it's unfortunate that we have such good uh, earth magic and we can't buff our ghosts. So that does hurt quite a bit there. These guys are cap only slow to recruit though, so I don't send them into combat. It would have to be a desperate situation if I was but you will need to do probably a little bit of site searching with one or two of them, death especially, and you're gonna be doing crafting with them. They can natively make Dwarven Hammers and they have the Master Smith bonus. Quite good there, very nice. They're not very efficient at 134 for 15. So they're, they're, I guess they're on the better side of it, but they're still to recruit. So I wouldn't get these guys for research purposes only. Next up we have the Hectoride, uh, an another really good one. Cap only, slow to recruit. Water two, nature three, 
and we get an air, water, earth, or nature. So you could get a nature, nature four quite high, or a water three quite high. These are pretty good. Again, two twelve for seventeen is not not for research, unfortunately. She's very inspirational. She has high awe, but she's expensive, quite expensive. You probably will spin some of these into combat. We natively can very easily cast foul vapors. And because we run around with ghosts that don't care about foul vapors, that's very strong. Note, they only have five poison resist, so that's not enough to sit in foul vapors. So you either need to buff some more poison resist or use an item or have it in your bless if you're going to do that. So you do not want her to catch some poison and end up dying. Only 15 HP is not that much. They do have recuperation, which is quite handy. Uh, and they are, whole, uh, they are uh, priest level twos. So they can do sermons of courage and they can get your bless out easily. Remember our ghosts do have morale and they are a bit scaredy. They're scaredy ghosts. So sometimes it is nice to have somebody there that can bolster that up. Uh, having these paths makes good underwater combat and good nature stuff that you can do. We could even make plays for some of the higher nature stuff if you if you had a reason to try to do that. Quite nice, quite nice. Good good mage. Although, again, slow recruit cap only. You're not going to have that many of them. Our final guy here is the Caberios, and this is a coastal fort only guy. He is probably your recruitable researcher at 70 gold. For nine, he is your most efficient one. Comes in with one earth and a fire, air, water, earth, 100% chance. And he does have a forge bonus. So this is the cost reduction, not the path increase for crafting. Ideally, you would want him with a dwarven hammer and an air random, making some owl quills for three air owl quills. He does have a resource bonus. So if you are wanting mundane troops for some reason, these guys can help bolster your resources so that you can get more out of a coastal fort. I don't like the human troops, so I don't use it for that, but it's there. They do cause a little bit of unrest just for existing. So keep an eye on that because you wanna keep your income coming as long as possible. Don't let this guy build a ton up unless you're patrolling it or using Melias to lower it. Keep that in balance somehow. Otherwise, this is your recruitable research if you can't afford to summon in philosophers and you're getting unlucky with their random spawns. Overall for our roster, I, I think this is an okay roster. Uh, if we started above water, these guys would be okay at, at expanding, at least at the very beginning. But because we start underwater, I don't think they're particularly useful. And I do feel like the sacreds are a trap. So I would not go in trying to bless your those sacreds a mage bless maybe uh do note sacred 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 so all of our leaders we care about barring our ghost commanders are sacred so i think a mage bless or a thug bless could be valuable there as for who to prophetize at the beginning of the game we start with an e4 in our capital and i think it would be totally reasonable to Prophetize him. Uh, we start with Amelia. I think it would be totally reasonable to prophetize her. I think you could go either way. For me, I like to prophetize the E4, and I have him sit in my capital and summon specters. I believe that makes him more efficient at it, and I need every ghost that I could possibly get. So that's the route I take. He's also relatively quick, so you can run around and claim thrones if need be on him. Just fine. As for national items, we have no national items. As for national spells, we have the Greek suite plus a little bit. So we've looked at a lot of these guys over and over again, so I won't go into too much depth here. Uh, the lamp pads do give you some area of effect bane fire, which might be useful depending on what you're fighting. We do have the pathing, although you'll have to do a little bit of boosting on your mages to be able to summon a Kokethoros. Could be quite good. We can natively summon the Hound of Twilight, which is pretty rare. Most of the nations that can summon these don't do it natively, and we can. I like this unit quite a bit. Now, why we would want this guy, I'm not certain. He's kind of anti-ghost slash undead, but they do good high patrol, which could be valuable. They have fear. Can be kind of a nice surprise unit, right? Because they're thinking you're gonna fight with just ghosts, and then you have a Hound of Twilight, a few of them, hopefully. Could be pretty interesting and they're, they're decent combatants 
and we have two paths that we could buff them. We can summon cares natively. So another unit that we always talk about that's like, well, how are you gonna get death two to summon them? Well, we, we can somehow finagle ourselves into having death two. They could be interesting. I think the Sparte are actually very interesting here because we probably will go up enchant anyways. This requires enchant six to unlock them. And we have high earth gem income. We could definitely throw these guys out and they're not undead, despite what they look like and they talk about being skeletals, they're not undead, they're magic beings. So they will not get banished. So a few of these guys to help bolster a front line that's maybe you're pretty much assuming is gonna get banished, could be quite nice. And they've got the gleaming gear that a lot of these uh, Greco nations have, which is very good gear. I mean, a 19 protection, they're temp troops, they are a combat summon, but I think in the right situation they can be exceedingly powerful. We have our E4 summon, which is our priest one that's gonna summon more ghosts, and our philosopher summon, which is our researcher. We also can summon in Telkins, and the Telkins are incredibly powerful. They auto cast foul vapors, and we have ghosts. So that means from turn one, so even if your enemy is gonna buff themselves with poison resist, you get it from turn one. You are off and running. Maybe you get lucky and get poison on something that's vital. These do come in at Conjuration 8, which is quite late in the game, but I think it might even be val valuable to get a couple low-hanging fruits and other things and rush straight up Conjuration to do this. We are going to be looking to find somehow to get Death Mages, and you can't wait for these guys. So... Either you're going to be looking at Spectres or Spectral Mages. Spectral Mages coming out of Conjuration 6, so that would be close to getting up here anyways. Very, very powerful. They do have Reaper, so they're going to kill some of your population off. They also can shapeshift when they are in their other form. They get an additional air and an additional water path. They are stronger in those forms. So... This comes in with a lot of magic pathing, very, very powerful mages, very powerful leaders, very good crafters because of this pathing plus Master Smith. Very, very good. Definitely worth thinking about doing that. I would argue it's worth designing your pretender with this in mind. To summon in the Telkin, you need five water and two air. And if you don't take that on your pretender, that's going to be relatively difficult. You don't have anybody who's going to have high air and even mediocre water, so you'd be doing some empowering. You have a little bit of water income and a little bit of air income, but not a huge amount. I, I think it's worth considering Telkins are that powerful when you design your pretender. All right, I'm going to show you just in my practice game here that I have in the background. I went with the good old donut. We started underwater. I had Pelagia over here, and I had Atlantis over here. I got bullied heavily in this game here. So I went on land, both over here a little bit, and then over here a little bit. And that's how I expanded in the early game. This was my first fort. This was my second fort. And once I got those two up, I was pretty much rolling, and I had two armies of ghosts, and I was able to get in here and wipe it out the ocean and take it over. And once I had taken them out, nobody else could get down here, and it was just free ocean territory for me. So I think that's something to keep in mind. With our roster the way it was, I didn't recruit anything except for a few special units. I got lots of indie mages. I had pretty good luck with that this game. I had some Pegasi and some uh, lizard riders I got, but I didn't get mundane troops. I stuck with my ghosts mainly. And I think that's generally what you're going to want to do as Therados. So you're going to have a rough early game, like a rough, rough early game. You don't start with enough ghosts as your starting army to reliably expand, and it could all go horribly wrong. Underwater is notoriously stabby, and notoriously having crazy things, mages, trolls, magic weapons, poison damage, magic poison weapons, things, other nations that have magic weapons... It's really difficult. I think you should strongly consider an awake expander of some form. Normally, people always ask about that. They don't see me play a ton of those. This is a nation I think wants one. 
or you at least need to have a plan of if you don't take one, how are you going to get the ball rolling? Because remember, you're on a timer. You are killing off population, and you need the money to be able to expand. So you are on a timer from the get-go, and everyone hates you because you're a pop kill nation. So if they see that you are weak, they will try to get rid of you ASAP before you ruin the territory that they are going to conquer. So I think you need to come into the game, hit the ground running with an awake pretender. I think that's a very, very strong choice there. So let's take a look at pretenders. I will show you the one I went with in this game, and then we can talk about the other chassis. In this game, I went with the Telkin, and I took him awake. Very strong chassis here. Actually, let's look at him differently because I want to show his candles. Hang on. Okay, here we go. So this is Seeloth, the Telkin God King. Pretty dang strong chassis here. Now, note, when he is in shapeshifted form, he's getting a plus one air and a plus one water. So this is higher than what I have paid for. I went with awake and pretty high dominion. I wouldn't normally say you need to go this high. It's just how the points shook out that that's what I got. And I went with Chilling Aura because look at what I did to my scales. We can just dump this. We don't care. We do like money, but we're not going to be recruiting troops. So we can go full turmoil, full sloth, full cold, full death, and then take high fortune, high magic. This gives us a lot of decent events, gym events. I, I did get a lot of bad events too, but... I don't care about pop loss because we're, they're going to die anyways, and those are generally the worst events. We don't have drain, so we're not going to have events that make us lose gems or anything. Having this guy awake meant that him plus a decent amount of ghosts could basically be guaranteed to beat anything because he will auto cast foul vapors, and especially the AI just cannot counter that. It's very powerful. And even a lot of humans would really struggle to do it. If they threw a uh, resist poison on their bless then they've made themselves weaker to every other nation essentially so they're really committing to going after you if they do that and it's kind of a waste in other places so a lot of people are going to be re reluctant to do that and even if they do take a bless for that you auto cast it with this guy so you will get that from round one and get some poison off no matter what they're going to try to do to stop you on that for the bless because we're in the cold and we have a few units that are not ghosts that we're going to want to be using i wanted to have some sort of cold resist and i decided to go with chilling aura it does work on our sacreds okay it gives you 10 cold protection which is enough to basically be immune to just fighting in the cold and it's just good for fatigue. We're running with ethereal ghost troops, so we can do fatigue grindy combat. And having just extra cold is nice. Our ghosts are cold resistant, so they're not going to be affected by it. And the R is not bad. We have lots of people who have water magic, so when they self buff uh, Breath of, of Winter, I think it's called, it really makes the R quite large. So it's pretty good there. Uh, I went with Withering Weapons because that's where my points had left, essentially. I needed death on my Pretender. I didn't want a chance relying on Indies to get it. This is what I could afford. I think you could switch over to other other death things, just undying, probably. I don't feel like you need the extra leadership, uh, undead leadership. You have plenty. That being said, I did take extra fire for Inspirational Presence. Our ghosts are kind of cowardly, it turns out. So having plus one inspiration is pretty good. Uh, it really helps buff that up to, I think our hoplites, that'll give them a 14 natively, and some of our other troops only an 11. The plus 50 leadership's nice. It helps your Melias that are going to probably lead some stuff around. Helps uh, everyone that's in our leadership pool except for our ghost commander. So pretty good there. This does give him good combat casting uh, spells too. You can air shield, personal misform, cloud trapeze. Uh, we have the water fire paths, which are nice for acid spells, for geyser spells. Uh, we could craft ourselves a room smasher if we want to get anti-magic resist stuff on him. We can summon earth power. We can do big earth meld things. Remember, our ghosts are floating, so they will not get hit by that spell. And lowering whatever they're fighting's defense way down helps them out because they're not great at attacking. Pretty good pathing here. Lots of combat spells. 
it does have the death that we need for climbing up death and just to summon our early game stuff. It, it would be very valuable to get at least some sort of death one, either indie or summon ASAP, because you're, you're gonna need help sight searching you're, or casting dark knowledge. And you're gonna need somebody to be in a lab to cast those summons. And you don't want this guy to be that guy. He needs to be out and fighting. You don't want him hanging around because he has high reaper. I was killing three to a thousand troop or three to a thousand population every single turn, no matter where he was. And we're not in a hurry to kill everybody, unlike say Middle Age Ermor would quite like to kill everyone off. We would like it if our pop didn't kill off people, but it is what it is there. I quite like this guy. He had decent research. He was awake from turn one. Uh, I had one really close battle where he got profuse bleeding and it just wouldn't stop. He had like six HP left. It was horrible. He doesn't come in with any gear. If you do luck into starting with construction one, it might be worth just grabbing a helmet and a piece of armor just so you don't have an oops moment with your big bad guy. Even if he fatigues out, Foul Vapors keeps going, so I would rather be protected and fatigued out than awake and dead. There is that. Otherwise, for Pretenders, we don't get a ton of choices, unfortunately. We have kind of the really limited underwater choices. This is him right here. Telking God King, 240 points. We get a 40 point reduction, which is an entire scale worth. On a lot of nations that could get this guy, it's really not worth it. You generally don't have the poison immunity. And your big draw of taking this guy is probably awake and foul vaporing from turn one. Note, he also increases our death scale, but we already have the plus one, so we don't get anything out of that. You could take an underwater only guy, like the big head here, or the octopus, but or the jellyfish. But we really do need to get on land. Uh, you're going to need to get there for thrones anyways. So I don't think I would go with that route. Same thing for the immobiles. This would give you the death you want, but you don't get the scale and you'd be relying on just your profit. Now we are underwater, so bishop fish are a little easier for us to do. And we have native air and water income. So we're guaranteed that we could craft ourselves an amulet of the fish so that we could get him above water. Or we could do a shambler skin either way to get, get him above water out there uh, to claim thrones. So it's not the worst nation to have an immobile but i don't think i would go that route one thing that would be of interest to you is sloth and unfortunately we only have three people that increase sloth that could be important because that would raise your philosopher up to a 16 research base that being said though these aren't the greatest expanders ever they're okay uh if you were going to go with one of them do note that your sea dragon is aquatic but he's a shapeshifter so he can shapeshift into what is he i think he goes down into a grand hydromancer yeah human form i think he goes into one of these it's just a human whatever it is he does have the extra sloth though he's okay he's got fear 10 which is quite terrifying so if i was gonna take this guy his protection's okay that would kind of be iffy you would probably want to get your Telkin paths on him, and then whatever other points you have left probably would put into... Yeah, I would probably go into Earth and take, like, hard skin. In fact, let's actually build one of these guys. Let's look at him. So we would tank our scales, of course, and we can't go even further on the sloth, so that's rather nice. Let's bring us up to, like, a baseline of, like, six. Let's see what we can do here. So Telkin pathing is right there can we get six for hard skin we can and then yeah we, we don't have enough for death though in that case um okay there we go that's that's okay i like that we spent all of our points we can put a water bracelet on him that's something we can definitely craft so we can get to telkins we can summon in although you would really need a death too but at least you could sight search and you'd be counting on an empower here this is awake, and we would want hard skin. So that's going to take him to 28. He would be he would be okay at, the, at 28. We have some high nature people, so you could research regeneration, have somebody buff him with that. And with three blessed points left, 
That's not, unfortunately, that good. Um, probably just the reinvig, and I don't even know. I guess I guess a point of precision or maybe winner's gift. I I, this, I wouldn't go this route, but this this could work. This could work. He does have ridiculously good fear, and that's something you really want on awake expanders if you can all help it you have dragon master which is nice because we can definitely use some of the drakes to, that we would summon in the cold drakes won't affect our ghosts so we can put them behind our ghosts and have them breathe through them that could be interesting and okay uh same thing over here for the earth serpent he would actually be cheaper to get that bless so if we went up to six here let's see so we would need six here we would want five here and two here, ideally. One here. Yeah, he couldn't even afford that. So, and he definitely would want to have hard skin. So I don't know. Those are hard sells to me. Uh, otherwise, you do have different titans here. We already have plus one magic scale. We already have a death scale. So those are out. I'm, I'm just not a huge fan of these. I really feel like you probably want this guy. Maybe you're going to do like an awake researcher. I guess, I guess if that's the case, you could take the Archmage. Um, he is aquatic only, so just note that. I don't know. I think this is this is the nation to take a Telkin God King. I think that this is this is the nation to do it on. Um, maybe the Ghost King. He could hide in with the rest of your ghosts. That could be kind of nice. He's relatively cheap. He's cheaper. So if you need some more uh, magic, he does have new magic path 20, whereas this is going to cost you 40. That could be a thing. I could see that. Okay, so let's bring this all together. We are a pop-killing, free-spawn, undead nation. We start underwater, but we have no problems getting above water. We have pretty decent magic access. Pretty good. Uh, we desperately want death, but we only have a 20% chance to get it. We desperately would like death income, but we only have a plus one. Uh, we have air, we have water, we have tons of earth, we have good smiths. So I think thugging is on the table. I think that awake expander is very valuable here. The ghost troops are quite good. Uh, finding a way to get some astral and do anti-magic buff for your army would be greatly appreciated by your ghosts. Remember, if you do take magic two scales in your dominion, everyone gets minus one magic resistance. So that will up your spectral weapon damage, but that will also make you easier to banish. So keep that in mind there. I think this is an incredibly cool nation. It's very fun. Uh, in the early age, it's rare to have pop kill. So that's something unique about them. They are a very influential nat uh, nation in the lore, and I think that that's just cool there. See see where a lot of these other nations spawned out of and the ramifications of what happened to them. They do not progress any further. Their successor nations do, but this is the end. We we fade out here. This is the, the dying gasp of a sunken nation. All right, if you enjoyed this one, I appreciate everyone leaving likes to help YouTube share it out. Uh, it seems like likes and comments are more important than ever for YouTube to actually show it to people. I can see the impressions on videos where I get that versus videos where I don't. Very appreciated for people who take the time there. I love the discussion. I'd be curious to see if other people like different pretenders. I'm, I'm very sold on the God King here. I love the Foul Vapor play, but I, I'm curious if people have other things that they like. I wish we had a bigger pool to choose from. It's unfortunate that we don't. Otherwise, I will see people for the Therados stream. I think it's going to be a spooky one and quite enjoyable. I will see you guys there. Have a good week and stay spooky.